Hello, everyone. <laughs> you failed. Can you guys hear me at the end? At the last? Okay, very good. So, welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Kamran Azim, Muhammad Kamran Azim, and uh, I'm from Prakma, Oslo. Uh, I come with a background of about 20 years of operations, and uh, for five years, I've been managing some of the largest supercomputers in the world at Saudi Aramco before this job. Right now, I'm with Prakma for the last two years, and where we are doing very much fun stuff with uh, continuous integration and continuous delivery using Docker, using Kubernetes, and lots of fun stuff. And uh, I have my colleague here, Henrik, who's from Denmark. Henrik? Yeah, my name is Henrik Hu. I'm from Denmark. I'm one of the boring employees in Denmark. I have the same nationality as my workplace. Uh, <laughs> and I'm white, so it's really boring. And I'm a male. Um, <laughs> so, really boring. Um, yeah, I've, my first computer was a Commodore 64. So, I've been working mostly as ops. And I've been at Pragma for two years as well. I think we started at about the same time. I was the first employee in Aarhus, and Kamran was the first employee in Oslo. And when we started, we were eight people. I think we are 45 now, yes. with 19 different nationalities. Yes. So, have a lot of, yeah, yeah, culture. Thank you, Henry. All right, so are you guys excited about this talk today? Yes. Okay, very good. So here it goes. So the title says it all. Uh, you can go home now. <laughs> so who recognizes this? It's a scene from some movie. Hmm? <laughs> no. Okay, so it, it, this is uh, uh, a screen grab from the movie Immortals. Uh, released in 2010. The idea behind this, it's just some funny coincidence. So in Greek mythology, so first I cover, I, I talk about the word Kubernetes. Uh, it's a Greek word and it's funny how we pronounce it as Kubernetes and the Greeks laugh at us because it's Kubernetes. Kubernetes. We but, have a Greek uh, guy. <laughs> So since uh, Kubernetes is Greek word, so we, I thought I should bring up something Greek. So this is, according to Greek mythology, these are the gods. And these are five in count. And I consider these as the five Kubernetes components. Three of them run on master or controller node, namely API server, scheduler, and the controller, yes. And uh, the two run on uh, worker node, the cube let and cube proxy. So I thought a uh, connection, so I just thought it would be interesting to show this. And in a way, we expect our nodes and pods not to die, just like these guys were not supposed to die. But the titans beat the crap out of them. <laughs> so anyway. Let's move forward. Uh, this is what a uh, Kubernetes cluster looks like, as probably most of you already know. So we have a, an API server at the heart, and we have a scheduler, we have a controller manager. And these three basically make up your control plane. And we have, uh, in this diagram, we have two nodes, just to emphasize on uh, multiple nodes. We have the same cube proxy running on two nodes and the cube led running on both nodes and some pods which are being managed. So in, in Kubernetes, everything looks up to the API server. That is the heart of Kubernetes itself. And API server talks to etcd. And I've just drawn one instance or one uh, depiction of etcd here. It can be a cluster and normally it is. So, we wanted to set up a Kubernetes cluster for a client, and they wanted it on bare metal. So we came up with this setup, and in this you can see we have a control plane, 
Uh, we tend to call them controllers. Uh, many people tend to call them masters. So uh, I will use this term uh, most of the time. We have a control plane. We have some worker nodes. We have HCD cluster. We have some shared storage through NFS. And this all makes up a Kubernetes uh, network or a cluster. We also have load balancer here running traffic. And this is the corporate router, and we have other components of this corporate behind uh, on this interface, whatever their other servers and their users and whatsoever. And this is their public connection to the internet. <coughs> Excuse me. And this is uh, a DNS server somewhere on the internet, and this is just some other computer on the internet. So this is, the idea is that we are running Nginx somewhere here, and we access, we, we are able to access it not only through corporate internal network, as shown here, we can also access it all the way from this computer outside, which is com somewhere in the world, anywhere. So that is what the setup looks like, which we wanted to set up. And we encounter some problems. So, when we were configuring, we configured controller nodes, we configured etcd, configured controller nodes, and then we went to con configure worker nodes, and then we realized, what API server do we point our queue proxy to? It only takes one argument as API server target. So this was a first big question. We couldn't risk saying, uh, specifying only one of these, because if one of these dies, what next? Do we go manually configure the worker to start talking to the other one? Because it doesn't take a string or a list of API servers, in the, especially in the queue proxy. Then we had a load balancer, and we didn't know which API server to talk to. We had the same problem here whether to use this one or to this, use this one. That's second problem. The ter third problem came, how do we make this load balancer highly available? Because all the uh, traffic which is coming in is coming into this load balancer. What if this dies? This becomes single point of failure. So we had these big questions here in the setup. Can you guys see? Yeah, I apologize for standing in your view. <laughs> Okay, so in the cloud it is quite easy because cloud, and you take, talk about any cloud provider, GCE, Amazon, they provide you with load balancers and you can put load balancer in front or behind of anything like so. And, that, and normally those load balancers are stable enough or the cloud provider takes care of them. Uh, so we could address one problem like so, and the second problem was solved by the using the cloud provided load balances. But this is cloud, and our setup is on bare metal. So cloud is easy. We could just set up a load balancer, provide its IP address to all the queue proxy instances, to also to our incoming traffic and everything is solved. But this is cloud, not bare metal. So we still had those problems. So then we thought what to do. How do we provide high availability to this setup, which we have? What if we provide a similar proxy ourselves? But then what if this dies? Uh, two proxies, and then what if the other one dies, and so on and so forth. So the problem was still there. The problem of high availability. We could now look up to the controller nodes, but we still have problem of high availability. This instance and this load balancer are still single point of failures. So we saw that some people are using DNS, 
they set up uh, multiple proxies, multiple load balancers, they set up a common DNS name with a very low TTL, etc. I would just say these two words, you can read these, but and there are many other problems associated to it. So, no, DNS, no go. This is our solution. This is not our solution. Yes? Have you thought of PGP multi-tapping? No. Okay. Didn't occur to me, sorry. Uh, since we were on bare metal, <coughs> and since I, br I had some experience of setting up such clusters in past, this was a natural uh, thing to do for me. So we introduced Corosync and Pacemaker to this problem. So Corosync is what used to be Linux Heartbeat project, or was it IVS or LVS? I don't remember exactly now. There was Heartbeat, and then there was Linux LVS, which is probably now Pacemaker. And Pacemaker talks to Corosync and manages resources over its cluster. Now you're going to hear two about you're going to hear about two different clusters. One is one cluster is going to be the Kubernetes cluster we are talking about, and the second is this high availability cluster. But let's first see what Pacemaker and Corosync does. This is a very sm simple conceptual diagram. Here it shows that we have some hardware, some, some services running on some machines, and then Pacemaker and Corosync running on top of that, managing some resources and monitoring them with some control loop, so to speak. When it detects hardware failure, it moves the resources to other nodes, depending on what you define in the policy. So, without further ado, let's configure controllers. So what we did was, we said in this Kubernetes cluster, the big one, we introduced a smaller cluster. We made controller nodes a small HA cluster using Corosync and Pacemaker. So these two nodes have their own individual infrastructure level IP addresses, for example, dot .21, dot .22. And we introduced a virtual IP, a resource, which Pacemaker controls. And that could be assigned to any one node at any given time. So all the nodes, anything else trying to contact this IP address lands on either of these two, depending on where it is at any given time. So that solves not only what to point to problem, but also the high availability, the single point of failure problem. Now this is a small cluster, so if one node dies, and if that node happens to be the active node, can, having the IP address, the virtual IP address, the moment it dies, the IP address floats to the other node, and the other node becomes active. And nobody ever notices what happened. The operations continue fluently. Then we address this problem of load balancer in the same way. Here. So we introduce two load balancers and we set up a small cluster for them. They have their own individual IP addresses, yes. But they get a virtual IP, which I forgot to write here. They have dot they have uh, the IP address dot forty. These load balancers. You will see it in the probably the next slide. So now the load balancers can look up to this, and the load balancers have their own virtual IP, which the incoming traffic sees. Um, my, my apologies for not writing the IP address. It's uh, it, it is ten to forty zero dot forty four zero. It's not written here. So this is how we clusterized or created subclusters inside Kubernetes cluster. And it has no interference with Kubernetes operations. You have to remember this. And we went ahead and did the same for etcd. So etcd has these nodes individual IP addresses, dot 11, dot 12, dot 13. 
but we gave it a virtual IP.10. So now, when master nodes or controller nodes need to talk to etcd instance, in, their, in the Cube API server configuration, we just specify one etcd address, and that is the virtual IP. And it talks to the etcd cluster. So before I go into explaining Corosync and Pacemaker, let me go back one step. So we assign a virtual IP to either of these two nodes, right? You understand that part? Yeah. OK. Controller nodes form an internal cluster. The Kubernetes software forms an internal cluster itself. There is a leader, which is elected by itself. And then the, the other nodes become followers. So if you are thinking that what if the IP address is assigned to a follower. Let's assume controller two is follower, controller one is leader, but the virtual IP address right now resides on controller two. It's not a big problem. It takes the request, it just gives it to the leader, and the leader does what it wants to do. And then, then the, and the business continues. And if, for example, the virtual IP was already on controller one and that was active, it just receives all the requests and handles them. So the, the point or the factor, or the, the thing that controller nodes have their own internal, net, internal cluster saves us from a lot of configuration on pacemaker level. We don't have to manage and bind our virtual IP address with the Kubernetes services. We don't have to bind that. Find out where is the leader and then go and set up the virtual IP address on that node. We don't need to do that. So we, we are saved in, in, in that aspect from a lot of configuration. So how it works? Yes. How much latency is there between the master nodes? Between these tools and uh, between APC themselves. They are on the same premise, on the same site, on the same rack. They are on the same premise, same site, same rack. So, so there is no latency. Yes. Yes, yes, go ahead, ask questions. This one? Yeah, okay. You're talking about uh, the controller as one is an master or the other for a master. Yes. Why is this case? Because you can use a simple load balancer, which you can um, place before the controller, and the controller are stable. Uh, the way we saw Kubernetes working, we saw one node acting as a leader and the others acting as followers. And we saw the same in etcd. Hmm. So, so that's why we came up with this design, that even if a, a, a master node is a, is, a, is a follower, then it can talk to, still talk to the leader, and then the leader can do whatever it wants to do. So these controllers are not so small in the first place. Yeah, I know, but just to make the point. Theoretically, theoretically, I have not looked into that. In so server, it's, uh, quite a heavy if you have a lot of nodes or something like that. You have quite a lot of? Uh, uh, you have a lot of uh, workers, or if uh, the API server, we boost uh, queries per second, so we could run the cluster a little bit faster. And we find that we need to balance the traffic to several API servers. Okay. So we, we 
doing more or less the same that you do, but we set up two proxies in front end and then we have the IPA, the floating IP and the balancing in there. Okay, so you, you are saying that you, you need a load balancer behind these two? And we can make that load balancer highly available. Yeah, yeah. Okay, we can do that. Yes, of course. Thank you for, for sharing this idea. But we did not do it. We can do it in, in, in our future products. Um, maybe I can answer that. Um, now think about GPU So you announced the uh, master IP from two different uh, machines. And so the router chooses which one to go to based on IP port hash. And so you have not actually, uh, not only a failover machine, but also a local answer. Okay, we can, we can discuss this uh, after the talk. It's a, this is very important, this is very important and a really good talk. So we will discuss this. Okay, very nice. So how it works? So Corosync actually, when Corosync runs, it forms some sort of ring as shown here a communication ring. It calls itself a totem ring, but let's call it a, a ring. And it keeps listening to the heartbeats of all the in nodes which are involved. And also makes sure that the quorum is there if it is configured and other stuff. And then we run Pacemaker on top of it, which talks to Corosync and extracts certain statistics and takes actions based on what Corosync reports. So Pacemaker manages the resource itself. The virtual IP here, which is moving between the nodes, that is, that is Pacemaker's job. That's not Corosync's job. Corosync's job is to make sure that it, it's listening to all the cluster nodes. And here the cluster is this HA cluster. So when the node fails, Corosync detects that. It tells Pacemaker, Pacemaker, acts on that and moves the resource to the other node. So you see, like this, it moves to the other node. That is the basic principle of co how Corosync and Pacemaker work together. And these resources can be anything. Here we are using IP address, they can be a service, they can be anything. And I wanted to highlight that when you use a high availability or when you set up a high availability cl cluster, it is very important to not have a single network because that single network can become your single point of failure because if the communication fails, the switch fails or something, the nodes, both nodes will think that they are the master and they are the active nodes and they will try to get hold of that resource. This is called split brain, the uh, split brain syndrome. And it is prevented by using certain fencing mechanisms. Uh, but primarily, to assist fencing, you need to have multiple communication channels between the HA cluster nodes. So here is just uh, an example I've shown you. We have two load balancers, and we have three small separate switches connected to these. And all of these are different different networks. So this is 10.240.00 slash 24. This is 192.168.101.0 slash 24. This is 192.168.102.0 slash 24. So these are three different networks. That means three separate Corosing rings, which, so if one fails, Corosing sees that the link has failed, but the communication is still there, so it doesn't go on and tell Pacemaker that you need to move resources. No, it informs Pacemaker that a link has gone down, but it doesn't, let, uh, doesn't ask it to move the resource. And this is how you should, well, the purists of HA, they, they say that if there are less than four networks or communication links, it's not an HA cluster. So sure, the purists can think like that, but here three are enough for us. So in order to set this up yourself, what do you need? If you try to do it on Amazon, 
you will not be able to because Amazon does not support broadcast and multicast and we need broadcast and multicast for chorusing to work. It sends its packets and, and listens to it and everything. So you can't do it on any cloud provider, any software defined network as I understand. I may be wrong. Uh, I didn't see a unicast option in chorusing configuration. Sorry? It worked? It used to work. No, it, it, it's not there. I, I searched everywhere in its man pages and everything. Yes, maybe you can, you can increase my knowledge. So what we, you can do is to set this up, you can use VMs or, of course, go for uh, the bare metal. And you do they support? Yeah. Okay, I don't know. This is the setup you're describing is exactly how their docs system describes setting up HA HA proxy. Very good. So if if the 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 provider you are using supports the multicast and the broadcast, then please go ahead use that. And you need to install Chorusing, Pacemaker, and PCS, just three packages. We are, we are Red Hat fans, so yum. No apt-get here for us. And this is a simplified uh, configuration shown. This is more or less what you need, nothing more complicated. So you, how do you set up a cluster? You just execute very simple commands. Few, few of them are missing here. I just wanted to keep things simple. But there's not much rocket science involved here. So you use these commands and plus few others and you will have a working HA cluster. For example, I show you the PCS commands status and it says that it has two nodes and one resource configured. It has, it has two controller nodes online and a resource called controller VIP is running on controller one. That means that is the active node right now, which has this IP, uh, this, uh, this resource. Controller whip is uh, dot 20. Demo, and for demo, I request Henrik. Yeah, I was asked if I wanted to break stuff and uh, don't say no to that. <coughs> So the screen resolution messed it a bit up, but I think you get the point here. Hopefully you can see everything. So the two top windows are from my uh, local machine, my host. I just do a kub control get parts and kub control get cs. So, um, so if, 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 you, if you can point to different components of the screen, yeah. different parts of the screen, this one is showing <coughs> Uh, uh, for every half a second, it's getting a list of ports, right, Henry? Yeah. And this one, this one here, is showing the cluster status. Q yeah. control get CS every half a second. Yeah. This one is uh, the output of IP address command from controller node one. This is output of IP address command from controller node two. And this is an, an active pod running Nginx, I believe, yeah. and a, a watch loop every half a second. And we are also pinging the virtual IP address, which is 10.240.0.20. Yeah. And these are our virtual machines running on KVM. Yeah. So I think I have like 11 virtual machines running on my laptop, so it's a bit slow and the network is a bit shaky. but so. What I want to show here is that right now you can see that the controller one has two IP addresses, the 21 and the 20. And the controller two has only the 22. It has its own IP. Um, and the thing with watch is that when something stops working, it doesn't fail by default. So it'll just So you'll need to look at the updating time. So if they stop moving, that's because it, it can't connect to it. 
Um, so if we start by looking at these two, and I kill this one, Falls off. Yes, very good. then you'll see that the virtual IP pops over to this one now. Now this one isn't updated anymore because it can't reach it, right? And this one connect, uh, continues to, to, to run the, uh, the IP AD, ADD command. So now everything is running on controller two, everything, all the traffic. And up here you see that everything is still working and it's fine. Now the other example is that I have my, my Nginx running inside my cluster and I exposed it as an, with an ingress. We have traffic, traffic running on two machines. We have uh, LB1 and LB2. And they also have a shared IP.40. Uh, and right now it's running on uh, the, the, the VIP, the virtual IP is on uh, LB1. Can we, Henry, can we kill this ICMP ping and can we ping dot .40 here? Yeah. Okay. You, you gentlemen, everybody saw here that uh, the ping did not fail uh, when we were pinging the controller nodes, and now we are pinging the load balancer virtual yeah. IP. So this curl updates every half second. It tries to curl the, the production.example.com, and if I kill my load balancer, then we see that it stops updating and then continues again down here. So, I mean, you, you will lose a couple of connections while you do the switch, but I think you will lose connections no matter how you do it. I mean, the problem with DNS, uh, basic DNS is that if two out of three controllers are down, then two out of three connections will, uh, will, uh, will not reach the destination. Every time. Every single time until you fix it. Whereas here you only lose a couple of connections while you actually do the switch. That's the advantage here. Yeah, so now it figured out that this is down. And then again, I can start it, these machines. And this one should start uh, acting again. Yeah. But the resource will not float back to the node which we turn on because we did not configure that policy. There's no point in moving a resource back to a previously failed node if it is working correctly on the other node. So there's no point in wasting switch over again. So, so this is a very simple test. I know it's not uh, very uh, scientific, but uh, just a small test to show that the IP moves and we can still keep on um, connecting, right? Can we go to our slides again? Yeah. Thank you, Henrik. Thank you very much. So we just killed a, killed a virtual machine. You saw it, so let's move forward. And this is the book address. Uh, it's work in progress, but uh, it, it it is going to contain all the configurations for pacemaker and Corosync and everything else, how we set up the cluster. And that's it. So questions, please. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Very, very good question. Good question. So the thing is, we had to deliver this cluster, and we couldn't afford going into another research loop of researching other technologies and bringing them under control and then putting them in production. And since I already had experience with uh, HA clusters uh, configuring, so I said, let's go ahead with this. It's tested for like more than, I think I've been working with these technologies for more than 10 years now. So, so it was a natural for us to just use this. 
but we can definitely look in uh, the other directions. Yes, more questions? Okay, that's it then. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you.